this is a very elementary uh, introduction to block codes, so apologize for those that are already finishing your PhDs in this area. And uh, just uh, lift your, your arm if you have any questions, and uh, we will start. I don't know. I don't know if I have. No, I think it's going to have to keep it close to my mouth. Can you hear me? No. Okay. It's full game. <laughs> Oscillation. <laughs> okay. Uh, you think it's okay? Then we, can, we go on. So, uh, briefly, we start with basic concepts. We talk about block codes. And this talk is continued tomorrow at the same time. And we have a second part. I don't know how far we will progress today. Yeah, sorry, Max. Yeah, I don't know how far we will progress today, but then tomorrow we complete going over cyclic codes and decoding cyclic codes. <coughs> when uh, I received the invitation for giving this short course. The, the idea was to have a short course on error correcting codes, but then I remember that many years ago, together with Professor Palazzo, we shared the course where I gave the block code part and he gave the convolutional code, so we decided to repeat this strategy. And so uh, the motivation for using error-correcting codes is this constant requirement. Maybe give it more volume. OK, because it's not. OK, it's, if, you, if you can't hear me, please <laughs> say so. Uh, so you have this constant challenge. When we think that we are already working at high speed, then a year or two years later, you get higher speed high speeds and then uh, better coding is required to cope with that. And throughout these last, say, 60 years, uh, we have our collecting codes contributing both uh, theoretically and helping technological advances in this area. Trocar o lado. Let me ajuda aqui. Okay. Okay. I think now it's it's gone. Anyway, and uh, at the beginning, uh, just tell me a bit of the history. Uh, the applications of coding appeared for space research, so it was thought that coding would be useful only for that application, and elsewhere, it was not useful at all. There was even a time after uh, the beginning of uh, this, this theory where they thought that it was good just for writing papers and had no real application. But as you know, that has proved to be wrong. And then, much later, uh, you have applications of coding spreading to narrow band channels. Before it was thought it was good only for channels with large bandwidths. And then every day you have every computer with the modem where you have uh, coding for a narrow band. And then you have the CD, DVD, and so on. So there is no question about that. And then, uh, sorry, I'm going back. Yeah, also storage and recovery of data in semiconductor memory benefits from error correcting codes the same way that we use coding for transmission. But then the reason for the area of communications in principle to exist is the presence of noise. If we didn't have noise, it would be like they say, life is in paradise. <laughs> no noise, no problem. But then uh, we face these problems of detecting or detecting and correcting errors that may happen uh, during transmission. And then, uh, for example, if you have a 
data transmission for a banking system, ideally you don't want errors to occur. When you, in order to see the context where coding appears, we look at communication systems. They keep changing the way they look in terms of servers, circuit components, equipment, as technology changes. And the idea is to make them smaller and smaller, more energy efficient. And then you have this old time relay equipment going to uh, tubes and then transistors and so on. But in general, you can represent them in the block diagram where you have a, a source of information that could be, in principle, analog, could be digital. The source encoder could be simply an analog to digital converter, but it can be more sophisticated, like uh, removing uh, redundancy from the source to make a more efficient representation of the data, then you can encode to add control redundancy so it can cope with errors according to your channel model. Then you go to this phase of the modulator where you adapt the shape of your signal to suit the media where it's going to be transmitted. And then goes through a noisy channel and here the receiver you have the operations that will try to bring back your signal to the original form. You begin with the demodulator, then you go to a channel decoder. I'm going very briefly here because the idea is not to go in detail here. Then you go for the source decoder. Finally, the final the still, uh, the, the data will be the sync. And uh, the source decoder, depending on how you do this, it can be lossless coding or lossy. But uh, in also in, in systems you have, uh, you can have source encoder combined with channel encoder or encoder and modulator. You have variations, but traditionally this is the model that we use. Talking about errors, they may occur either during transmission or storage of data. And the types of errors, uh, they can occur uh, randomly, sporadically, and then independently, we call them random errors. And if they occur, uh, all is lumped together, you can, we call them burst, the model as a burst of errors. It must not necessarily means that all the digits affected in the burst are in error, but they, they have this characteristic. And you, say that the channel has a memory. When you talk about channel models, uh, ideally the receiver should be able to process the signal as it comes. It's an analog signal. So we, we're talking about a digital system. So this channel would have a digital input, say a finite alphabet, and the output would be continuous. So discrete input, continuous output. But for, in practice, uh, it's not normally uh, practical. So you go to quantize the output to a finite number of levels, typically 8 or 16 levels. That's what you do. And then two typical discrete channel models means discrete input, discrete output. One is the binary symmetric channel. The other is the binary erasure channel. I'm not going to draw a diagram, but what characterizes, say, the, the binary uh, symmetric channel, you have two binary inputs, two binary outputs, and the outputs are either correct or they assume the complementary value. It means if you have a zero, the zero can be correct, or either it's the value of a one that was changed to zero. In the binary erasure channel, either the digits come correct or they are they come as erasures. It doesn't mean life has to be like that. You have to make an experiment and see if one or the other would be more adequate to represent. And of course, you have variations on that. You can have the binary erasure channel modified to combine with the binary symmetric channel. And so it depends very much on the situation that you are dealing with. When you talk about codes, uh, 
the linear codes, since they are amenable to mathematical treatment, they appear very often. And what characterizes them is that you have pari check digits that you add to, you append to your information, and they result from linear combination involving information digits. And you have no linear codes either. This just be talk in general. There can be nonlinear logic operations on the information digits, like the pilot checks, or as it appeared to be relevant, you have a mapping from a larger alphabet, say to binary, for example. You have the integers of a the integer ring Z4 mapping to binary, where the code can be linear in Z4, but nonlinear in binary. <clears throat> Depending on the way that you append redundancy to your message, you have two, basically two types of codes. You can have variations on those. You have either block codes or convolutional codes. And the, the distinction we see in a moment, just to mention that they're both competitive in many practical situations, and what makes you decide for one or the other will be the kind of application, your data format, delay decoding, system complexity, and so on. There was a time that was typical in some information theory conference that you had these called duels, someone supporting block codes, someone else supporting convolutional codes. A famous one that happened was in China uh, with the Shu Lin, I think, and Blayhut discussing this. Oh, yeah, Lin and Blayhut, yeah. But anyway, uh, both codes are good, depends where you want to use them. Who was defending which? Who was what? Defending which? Uh, Shulin defending block codes. Although he has worked on Kubalushna as well. Later, you know, in, in, in Russia, there was again this uh, big table with important scientists there. And then uh, they finally started to support convolutional codes and Blehut came on and said DVD, CD, it's okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> it depends very much when you want to use them. Of course, uh, most of these uh, deep space probes, they, they use convolutional codes. And then when you have block codes, the main point is that redundancy in a code word is to check only that code word. It's nothing to do with uh, Code words that have already been transmitted, or those that are yet to be transmitted. <coughs> when you have convolutional codes, you have a memory in the encoder that relates to a few blocks, and that's the, the idea. And they are characterized as a special case of so called tree codes. It's interesting that mathematicians tend to like more block codes because there is a lot of algebra that can be applied. Convolutional codes have excellent results, but it's not, so far I don't have a, you know, so much theory about them. You know the results, and uh, still some codes you get and you don't know exactly how you got there. Again, this seems to be happening with uh, with block codes, something that I'll just mention later on, when you have some LDPC codes, uh, low density pipe check codes, where in, in, in simulation you cannot measure the probability of where you have to try and use. I'm saying this that the Professor Shuli mentioned he was, he had a contract with the army, and uh, they wanted him to write the probability of where after the code, and he said, I'm not to commit my life you know, signing these, you do the experiment and see what you get. But anyway, uh, it's good to make a point here that by no means we guarantee error-free communications. Although you have coding, but you want systems to have an error rate that is acceptable for the user. If you ask Say a customer comes to ask you a code for a coding system, you, you ask what's the error rate you want. It says zero. But there's no way you can ascertain that. So this is just an example. When you buy a book, you have about uh, one letter you know, misprinted 
in 10,000, you still don't throw the book away. But if that happens in a, say, in a system operating in the bank to transfer money, that would be disastrous. To give you an idea, they expect the banking system to have, say, or detect one error or per semester or per year, not, not more than that, on average. <clears throat> but all this uh, had a reason. It started 1948 when Shannon, who is the father of information theory, and there are correcting causes and consequence of information theory, uh, he established a theorem. It's not for any channel. It's, he proved this for a memoryless channel. And since then, we have our expert here, Max Gloss. They have been extending results for other types of channels. But the important thing was that he realized that you could, you, once you define your channel model, you compute the capacity. As long as you transmit at a rate, capital R, less than C, and you decode using maximum likelihood decoding, that I will explain in a moment, you can reach a probability of error that decreases exponentially with the length of your code board. Anyway, as you get longer and longer code words, it means the complexity of your coding system increases. And the way Shannon proved his theorem, he gave no clue how to construct codings. It was a proof of existence. And so it seemed that after that, every code that engineers would design were far away from that so-called promised land. And when in 1993, a French group published a paper on turbo codes in, uh, in Geneva at ICC conference, most people there were skeptical. They didn't think that result was right. They said maybe they did the, the common 3DB mistake when they plot the curves and so on. And amazing, these people were not originally from coding. They were doing something else. And uh, I sought out by Claude Peru, one of the inventors. He said he believed that feedback was good for many things in electronics. So he thought feedback should be good in coding as well. So he applied feedback in the decoder to improve uh, the reliability of the, the decisions. And he got that result. And later group in Germany from Professor Hagenauer, they followed that, they reproduced all the results and everything was OK, it was correct. <coughs> but this I already mentioned, as you want to reduce exponentially the, the probability of error, you increase system complexity. Anyway, there are some details that we don't need to go in very deep detail now, but sometimes you don't use an optimum decoding, you use a suboptimum, but it's already close enough to the best and it's amenable to practical implementation. And then goals of coding theory, in principle you want to find long and efficient codes. So don't expect very short codes to do the job. We want codes. And then you need practical methods for encoding and efficient decoding. By that, we mean you can design a code which has very good parameters. But if you don't have a simple way to implement or amenable way to implement an encoder and decoder, then it will be just like a benchmark. But we need to make uh, modifications to make it is usable in practice. It doesn't mean that it's of no use. It's very important. But then to be able to use in practice, you have the constraints for the implementation. <clears throat> then recently, you have uh, new developments in, uh, in hardware technology. And you make possible to implement more sophisticated systems. Once I read something like uh, before much Many years ago, the limitation was for some memory. Memory was very expensive. You couldn't do this and that. Nowadays, I think it's man's imagination to design and do because you have the, the hardware is around. So it's just to improve your algorithms so you can implement them. 
so you can benefit from the advantages of coding by using uh, current technology. <coughs> Here is just a, a very simple exercise. Uh, we assume you have a source producing eight equally likely messages. And each one is encoded by a, a seven bit code word. And I chose on purpose, if you look, say, at this one here on the right, if you shift to the left by one position, you get this one, this one, shift to the left by one, you get that, and so on. So you have one all zero code word, and the seven remaining code words are cyclic shifts of one of them. So assume these code words are transmitted through a binary symmetric channel with a probability of error that usually is assumed that be less than half, means less than 50% of the digit being in error. Then, say, what, what would be the probability that an error pattern would not be detected by this system? Well, uh, since, uh, because of the property I mentioned earlier, if you add module to two of those code words, you get a code word in the same code. But then the narrow pattern will not be detected if it coincides with the code word. And for this particular set, it is preserved by module to addition of two code words. So a narrow pattern will not be detected if it coincides with the code word. If it coincides with the code word, it will be added. So there is no way you can tell. And so the answer for this probability of undetected error is just the probability of a pattern like one of those code words happening. If it's the all zero code word, you have errors acting independently. So P is probability of error, probability of being corrected is one minus P. So it's one minus P seven times to the power seven. And for the other seven code words, they all have four ones and three uh, and three zeros. But if there's still not an error. Sorry? One minus p to the seven is not an error. Yeah, there is no you can see all that out. There is no way to, you're right, you can remove that. Yeah. The probability of uh, is only if you have ones. So when you talk about block codes, you go for the encoding process. And then it consists just of segmenting your data in messages. Usually, you say k digits. And you append n minus k digits to each block. And then uh, you can use the redundant digits just to detect errors in just detect errors or detection and correction. And depending on the application, you can use also for uh, detecting or, or not detect, just correcting erasures. Then we go on to linear block codes. As I mentioned earlier, it can be linear or nonlinear. We're more interested in linear block codes. And they represent the part that is more well developed of error correcting codes. And this, as I mentioned earlier, is due to use of linear algebra, finite fields, or Galois field theory. <coughs> when I don't mention the code alphabet, usually the implied is a binary alphabet, if it's not clear and we mention. And then, in general, you use a QRA alphabet, Q being the power of a prime number. And then we come for the definition of a linear block code. The notation used is this, uh, N, K, D, and the alphabet is a QRA alphabet. So you can see a linear block code as a set of q to the power k, uh, qr, the co uh, n tuples. <coughs> Any two 
of those n tuples different at least d place. And this set of code words is a subspace of the space of all q to the power n, q, r, n tuples. No, linear code is a subspace. Then you have the mathematical representation using matrices. First, we look at this parameter called the code rate, capital R, is the number of information digits in a block divided by the block length n, k over n. And then usually you can represent the code words as vectors having n components or n coordinates. Sorry. And these components, of course, will be elements of the finite field that you are working with, GFQ. Or, and if it's binary, the elements will be 0 and 1, of course. Yeah. We can uh, use the base one, the subspace can have more than one basis, but take one of them and then you can represent as rows of a matrix, which will be called the code generator matrix. And if you have the generator matrix, it has k rows, which are linearly independent vectors and, and columns. And from that G matrix, the generator matrix, you can construct the parity check matrix, capital H, that will have n minus k rows and n columns. And the row space of the generator matrix orthogonal to the uh, matrix, the H matrix. Usually you can use this, this is a special representation called the reduced echelon former. Here you have a unit matrix and you have this little g, which is k rows by n minus k columns. The, the interesting aspect of this is suppose you're using code in, and it doesn't, have, it doesn't have to be as simple as that, but if it is in this called systematic form, if for some reason your decoder is not working, you can forget about the n minus k digit and just recover the first k digits as they come. If it's not a systematic form, you cannot get anything. So if V sub i belongs to the code subspace, <coughs> V sub i times H transpose gives a vector which is, sorry, all zeros. And again, uh, similar to what was done for the G matrix. The H matrix can be placed in this form where you have a little h here and then a unit matrix. This little h is n minus k row by k columns. <coughs> and the, the other part, the identity is n minus k by n minus k. The little g and little h, they are related by this expression. And one is the transpose of the other. And then, since the rows of the h matrix are linearly dependent, they form also linear code with parameters that are block lengths n, n minus k information digit, and the, the difference between uh, the position, the, where they differ in two code words is some d prime that we don't know yet. And then this code is called the dual of the code generated by, by the G matrix. <coughs> so this gives an idea how you could implement the encoder, multiply a vector, a row vector with K digits by the G matrix, which is a K by N. And the result will be a linear combination of rows of the G matrix, therefore a code point. So we come to an important part of the code, which is its ability to detect errors or detect and correct, which is its minimum distance. But before defining that, we need about humming weight and how many distance between two vectors. 
the Hamming weight of a vector is simply the number of non-zero uh, positions in that vector. And the Hamming distance between two vectors of the same length is the number of positions in which they, they differ. And so the Hamming distance, you should remember that is a metric. It means it obeys three properties, it's reflexive, symmetric, and triangle inequality. And so for a code, a linear code, the minimum distance is, is the smallest Hamming distance between pairs of code words. So this is just to give the idea. If you have two vectors, the, the Hamming weight is number of non-zero coordinates, so V1 has weight 2 and V2 has weight 4. And the minimum distance, if you compare coordinate by coordinate, they differ in two coordinates. That would be the minimum distance. So the Hamming distance between them. So let's say Q is the power of a prime. Then due to the linearity property, if you add modulo Q, Q, any two code words, you obtain another code word. Here, I apologize, instead of plus, I think it should have a minus here. Suppose the difference between these two is another code word. From the definition of how many distance, it will be to follow that the distance between V sub i and V sub j will be the Hamming weight of the third and double V sub L. Once we know this for a linear code, so to determine the minimum distance of a linear code would mean just to find the code word which is non zero and has minimum weight. So that would save you from comparing pairs of code words that is roughly proportional to the block length to the power 2, depending if, if it's a long block length. And if you just check word by word, it would be m minus 1 code words. Still, that's not a big victory, because this can be very large. It's just to give an idea of what it would be. This is a very well-known result. If you have a binary code with a minimum distance, which is an odd number, if you add an overall body to check, you produce a code that has the same number of information digits, the block length increases by one, but important, the minimum distance increases by one. <laughs> then, uh, since the minimum, this is just read there, please. Uh, since the minimum distance is the, the minimum weight of zero code word, and if that's odd, if you add an overall body check, it will be even. So you increase by one, the minimum distance becomes B plus one. So if, besides being linear, the code has additional mathematical structure, you can use that to determine either the exact minimum distance or upper and lower bounds for the minimum distance using such properties. This just to emphasize that the minimum number of changes that you have to make in a code word is at least D to change it to another code word. So if you are in a situation where at most D minus 1 errors have occurred that can still be detected, it will not change the code word into another valid code word. <coughs> and uh, we have to decide when we're doing the error correction, the code word that was most likely to have been transmitted. Usually we assume that the code words are probable. And using this assumption, we decide for the code word that is nearest in terms of how many distance. Assume a channel model, for example, like that we see where the probability of error is less than half. Then you can prove that uh, the code words which are nearest are more likely to have to be the correct one. If that's not the case, then you lost. You make an error. 
So as long as the number of zeros, t, obey the inequality 2t plus 1 less than or equal to the minimum distance, this system will operate correctly. Then we go to the next step, zero syndrome and decoding. Suppose we have a valid code word V sent through a noisy channel. And then when you receive the signal associated with V, you are going to process it to produce an n tuple R, which is defined over the code alphabet. This received n tuple may be different from V, of course, because of the action of the noise. And the task of the decoder is to recover V from R. The first step is to check whether R is a cold word or not. If it's a cold word, you relax, you don't do anything. But how do you do that? You multiply the vector R by the H transpose matrix, and you get this vector S, which is called the syndrome, is an n minus k component vector. If the syndrome is all null, all zero, you assume that you have no errors, assume r equals v. If s is not zero, so r does not match a code word, in principle you have already detected errors. How are you going to correct? That's another problem. Usually in this channel you have additive noise, you represent the received vector as v plus e, where e denotes an error vector with the symbols belonging to the same alphabet as a code alphabet. So decoding will involve a decision in which code word was transmitted. And one way to look at this is something called the standard array. You consider a partition of the all to the, the power n possible uh, binary and tuples. You separate into two to the k disjoint subsets, each subset containing a valid code word. So the coding will be correct if the received and double belongs to the subset where the transmitted code word belongs. So this way you separate the two to the power and binary and doubles into co-sets. I'll go for the for the diagram. You first row, you just use your code words. Then pick an n tuple that is not in the first row, like not a code word, and you put below the zero, then you add to v1, to v sub 2, and so on, form the second row. The third row is formed by using another vector that's not present in the previous two rows, and so on, and then uh, you have this table, which should be the partition of the two to the power n, n tuples, and usually you select to be the leader, each row is a coset. The leader of the coset, the coset leader, is the most likely error pattern if you can determine those. For example, if you have a code to correct, say, two errors, you would fill in the first column with the error vectors of weight one when they use them all, then start weight two, and so on. Those would be the more likely error patterns. The property of the concept is that all the elements in this concept, they have the same syndrome. So once you compute the syndrome, you check the leader and assume that was the error. I already mentioned this. <coughs> anyway, but this... Uh, you have to find the role, therefore the associated leader and perform error correction. Usually this is more, it's more a way to help you understand the structure of, of your code, not as a practical way to, to decode the you know, correcting code. We're going to talk about some more ways of doing it which are potentially more useful. This maximum likelihood decoding is very good if your code has a small number of code words. 
it has like a more towards you go for suboptimal ways that would approach maximum likelihood, but not exactly maximum likelihood. So you assume that your word, code words are selected independently, and they all have the same probability of being sent through the noisy channel. Optimal in a way that we mentioned in a moment. Is it compared? They receive them double with no possible code words. And uh, you mean in binary, going to compare, they receive them double, two to the k distinct, and doubles. And then the code word nearest in terms of how many distances, if you're using binary alphabet, it would be your decision, the code word you choose. This is supposed to be the transmitted code word. But this can take a long time because you have to check two to the k code words during a time interval corresponding to the duration of n channel digits if you're doing it online. And this makes this process not very attractive in many practical situations, not viable. A similar conclusion holds if you want to do it in parallel, if you want to have parallel decoder implementation, because then you start to increase decoder complexity. This is just the explanation for the name maximum likelihood decoding. Um, you have P of R given V is the probability of R being received when V is the transmitted code word. If all code words have the same probability, of being transmitted, this joint probability is maximized when you choose V that maximizes P of R. Because you know you can write this as uh, the product P of V times P of R given V. If they are all equally likely, so you maximize. And this is called the likelihood function. So that's why it's called maximum likelihood decoding. Another way of decoding, linear codes would use a systematic search. In this case, uh, what we do is to compute the signal from the received and double. If we have a scheme like that standard array, we associate each signal with a correctable error pattern. So once you have the signal, you search for the error pattern that is associated to that signal to make the correction. Again, this becomes infeasible, infeasible if you have too many situations, in too many cases. So you calculate the received syndrome by systematic search, you find the pattern of correctable errors, means a concept leader associated with that syndrome, and then you subtract from the received and double to perform error correction. So you have to generate successfully all configurations of correct errors. And if you want to do that's one way of doing it. And you can use logic gates to implement that. <coughs> Again, this is the number of patterns that you'd have to check. So this tends to, to be large as well. It grows rapidly with N and T. So this decoded has limited applicability. Oops. When you go for a different type of approach, which is probabilistic decoding, in principle, you would use the unquantized values that you receive from the channel, the sample of your received signal. But in practice, usually you quantize and your loss is small. And again, you have the implementation justifies that. Usually, as I mentioned earlier, quantize to 8 or 16 uh, levels. And you see the goal of you have the law of diminishing returns. You increase the price and you don't gain as much in performance. So if you have just quantization to two levels, you call it hard decision decoders. If you have more than two levels, you go for soft decision decoding techniques. I mentioned here 
the important always of the it was published in 76. I don't know why, but people don't mention it very much. But it's interesting that it's optimal in the sense that minimizing the probability of error per digit when the code words are actually probable. And they check, the, it's exhaustive, but checking all code words in the dual code, not in the code itself. So it's interesting for decoding high rate codes. Since the, uh, the tubo code used the BCJR decoding, which is again a, a much more like a new decoding, it approaches that. People tend to look at the BCJR, but this is again uh, is a, a possibility to be checked. So this is interesting for codes with high rates contrary to what happened to most other techniques, which just go for the code words of the code itself. And if it's a large number, it's not practical. Another interesting algorithm to do soft decision was introduced by Jack Wolf in 78. Then you use your data to move along a trellis defined by the structure of the parity check matrix. And so the receipt double used to determine you have a metric, and you measure that to decide the most likely path in this trellis. And you have many other possibilities uh, now for tubo, appro approaching tubo codes and uh, LDPC codes in the literature. Those are the basic ones. Now we look at some simple and corrected codes. So this is just to help understand the, you know, the structure of codes and other mechanisms that might meet in future. So the code parameters, sorry, uh, we start with this binary repetition code. You have one information digit in the block of n, the remaining n minus one digits will be the repetition of the information digit. And so this code has two code words, the all ones and the all zero code word. And the parity check digits are identical, just a repetition of the information digit. Simple decoding rule is just to count the number of ones and decide, take a majority vote. If the block length is even, then you, if you have a draw, a tie, then you decide that you have detected errors, you don't have to decide that it was all zero or one. The minimum distance of this code is equal to the block length. Although it has a larger correcting power, the rate diminishes. That is one over n as the block length increase, you have a diminishing code rate. The number of errors it can correct is t less than or equal to the floor of n over two. So we go to the, well, somehow the, the complement of that, or do of that, is the single parity check code. You just make the addition of a parity check that makes even the total number of ones in the code word. And then uh, if the number of ones is odd, you detect an error. If it's even, you accept. But you know, even uh, with a code like this, here the rate is uh, k over k plus one, so the rate approaches one. If you have soft decision information, you may be able to correct, see correct one error, because it, if you have only one position that has much lower reliability, you're very likely that was the position where the error was, although the code has minimal distance two, which would guarantee our decision just detecting the you know, odd number of errors. You say odd number of errors, but be interested in those more likely, being one error in this case. We already mentioned this. Yeah. When you use just error detection, if you have a, a feedback channel with a very low noise, 
this is used for to request retransmission. Okay, especially if you're using also if you're using soft decision. Now let's go to the next step, which is the binary handling code. So the first step binary code, non trivial. And uh, Marcelo decided to pay homage to Hamlin by having his photograph in the bench and not to cause trouble he had shown on, it on the other side. <laughs> so it was very clever. Maybe someone else is complaining that could not be included. But anyway, that was a good idea. So we go for this very basic 743 Hamlin code, block links 7. Four information digits and minimum handling distance three. <coughs> These ideas you can generalize for handling codes having other block lengths and more information digits. So in this case, number of parity checks is just seven minus four is equal to three. And then uh, let's see how you build up the parity check equations. We have here an array with three rows and seven columns. Uh, each column represents, the, I didn't include there the all zero column, but then represents a possibility for a no zero pattern of information digits. So if you look like you're reading binary with the least significant here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hamming decided to associate the columns that correspond to powers of two with parity check positions, denoted by C, C sub one, C sub two, C sub three. The remaining columns were filled with information positions. So you have K sub one, K sub two, K sub three, K sub four. And so, although this is going to be written there, but I just mentioned here, uh, how do you compute the first parity check, C sub one? You go to this row, where it is the only one here in this column, and it will be just the addition of those information digits that have a 1 on this row. It's k sub 1 plus k sub 2 plus k sub 4. If you go for C2, you go for k sub 1, k sub 3, k sub 4. And finally, C3 will be just k sub 2, sub 3, sub 4. So, just repeating there, the numbers that correspond to 2 to the power j, they're associated with pi check positions, and then use numbers that are associated with information positions. And so you form these three parity check equations. Before we go on, uh, just mention if during transmission, say for example, you had an error at position k sub 1, you notice that this should fail, because what you do when you receive your in top, we're going to recalculate the parity checks and compare with those that were received. So when you compare, if you are have an error in K1, this will fail, this will fail, and this will not fail. So it means it'd be a one, a one, and a zero. So if you go back here, uh, when you have C1 was one, C2 was 1, C3 was a 0, so you identify which position was in error. And the same goes on for all the other positions. Since all columns are distinct and none of them is all 0, you find a single error in seven positions. No one is interested in correct errors in the parity checks, but it works as well if there are errors in the parity checks, you have the same rule. So, you just do modulo to addition of the recalculated parity checks with those that were received, and in this way you compute the syndrome. I mentioned that already. So in this case, I took the error in position at k sub 3, and then that's how you locate it. That gave the false idea, excuse me, that you could easily extend that to correct double errors. <clears throat> but it took roughly 10 years for a code to correct double errors to, to appear. 
okay, as assuming like a generalization of the Hamming codes, which are the BCH codes that we talk about about them later on. These codes, what is so special about them? <coughs> First, it's not trivial and can be easily decoded. And they receive the definition to be perfect when they satisfy this condition here with the quality. This, in general, for a code of a GFQ. What this means is that if a code can correct T errors, the redundancy is used to correct single errors, double errors, etc., up to T errors, and after that you have no redundancy left. You have exhausted all the redundancy just to correct up to T errors. These codes are perfect. Still, there are only a few of those. We'll come back later to that again. But it doesn't mean if you have an excess of redundancy that might correct some T plus one else that this code is useless. If it is like this, it's still an optimal code, although not, not perfect. <coughs> so just with the exception of the, the Hamming codes, you have this Colair code binary, 23, 12, distance 7, and the ternary Colair code 11, 6, 5. You don't have no trivial perfect codes. If you go back and check that single parity check code is trivial and the repetition code, the trivial codes, they are perfect but they are not, not trivial. But you have uh, non-linear single error correcting codes with parameters identical to Hamming codes that they were introduced by a Russian a research at Basilev in 1962, and after that you have all the papers extending a little bit this theory introduced by Basilev on nonlinear uh, <coughs> single error per, uh, perfect codes. It's interesting that uh, the original paper by Golet, it took just half a page, and they say it's perhaps the for code theory, the most important half page written because he found these codes. Again, it's important to call your attention that it's not enough to guess N, K, and D and write this equation. It's important to construct the code because you have a number, a block length, I think is 92 binary. If you compute to make it correct double errors. You have the parameters of a perfect code, but no one can construct that code. So you have to have the code. If you have the code and the parameters satisfy that, then it's perfect. Because it's not always true. <coughs> yeah, this would be just a very elementary exercise. You have the set of body check equations and to construct the set of code words for this code. So C1 is just K1 plus K2, C2 is K2 plus K3, and so on. C3 is K sub 1 plus K sub 3, and this K sub 1, sub 2, and sub 3. Uh, then for having the messages here, you would have the code words assuming that we follow this order, A sub 1, sub 2, sub 3, and here the parity checks. <laughs> to reduce both the parity check matrix and the generator matrix in reduce the echelon form, you can just take from here, you pick the rows, say, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1 to be the first row of the G matrix. Then you have 0, 1, 0 and the remaining for the second row, and the 0, 0, 1 for the third row. And then here you can take this K by 4 matrix, take the transpose of that, that would be here, and you can easily form the capital H matrix by having little h followed by an identity matrix which would be 4 by 4 which 
express this in this form. Actually, going back to the Hamming code, that array that I placed there, you can see that is exactly the parity check matrix for that code. And since all columns are different and non zero, you can uh, correct one error. That's the condition to construct a, a single error correcting code in binary. If it's no binary, you cannot have a column which is a multiple of another, besides being all distinct and non zero. Here's just to mention LDPC codes that were again a, a big contribution. Funny thing is that Gallagher, Bob Gallagher from MIT, had discovered those codes during his PhD and published his thesis. But there was no way he could simulate, or even there were he suggested excellent. And so after Turbo Codes appeared, Soon after that, low density parity check codes they were rediscovered. I, I asked even uh, the, this uh, friend Jim Massey at the time, said, what was the reason for people going after Gallagher's code? Because you, know, you had turbo codes, and are you going to read each of pieces that happened, say, 30 years ago, and so on? My thought, maybe I'm completely wrong, but I said that there was a patent on the turbo code, so anybody tried to use it would have to pay for it. It's a company called AHA, which is not a, a rock group, aha, uh -huh. it, it, it has a circuit that maybe some of you are using. It has uh, turbo codes implemented as product codes, and that was not covered by the patent because the patent used convolutional codes. So it was a way to go around and, and use that. But anyway, it turned out that the, uh, the, the, both the turbo codes and the LDPC codes, they, they approach very closely uh, the, the capacity of the channel. And now it is feasible both to simulate them and to implement them. And there are things that you only hear when you talk to one guy to another that you don't see in books. There was a, a competition to choose, say, codes for uh, digital terrestrial link for, digi for TV. Digital TV, terrestrial link. And during uh, the presentations, the people presenting to the codes showed the results. And one of the men in the panel asked details of the results. And they said, no, this we did not simulate. We took from some other place. So it was disqualified immediately. And people from the company connect to Hughes aircraft. They were very professional, did very well, and they, they won. And LDPC codes, it's not that turbo codes are no good, but they have proved to perform better than turbo codes in many applications. Bob Gallagher, early 1960, had discovered them, but it was not feasible to test or to implement these codes. It's some 20 years uh, later, in the 81, precisely, Michael Turner, a professor in California, he wrote the paper that is now very famous because of the Turner graph, and that somehow paved the way to further theoretical advancements and allowed this representation of LDPC codes using Turner graphs. Again, a number of papers, not saying the results are not important, they're important, but some of the results that came later on, they had a random construction of the LDPC code, and so it was not, 
it was not straightforward to implement the encoder. That's later, uh, Shulin came with uh, codes based on uh, projective geometry and Euclidean geometry, where you had like a systematic implementation of these codes that was easier. And it, it, the turbo codes require an interleaver, LDPC codes no. And uh, they achieve, when you have either turbo codes or LDPC codes, you have this curve that goes down as signal, probability of error goes down as signal to noise ratio increase, but then you have a saturation that's called error floor. You can reach lower error floors for comparable complexity using LDPC codes. Still, this is not very clearly understood. Someone says something, they say, propose to concatenate use after the LDPC code would say a VCH code to correct the random errors to reduce the error flow. But that is a, like a cut and dry solution. Sorry. So this just LDPC codes are defined like any normal linear block code. You have these parameters rho and gamma. Rho has to be small in comparison to the code block length and gamma small compared to the number of rows in H, uh, capital H. So you define the LDPC code, a set of code words that satisfy the Parry-Check equation that has row ones per row and gamma ones per column. And this number of ones in the column should be uh, small. The, any two columns should differ in at most, have at most one, one, one in common. It means it, that's why it's from more density. You have uh, more zeros than, than ones, and the column should satisfy that condition. Of course, it can have ideas and try algorithms to produce such matrices and see the result that you get. And funny enough, you don't go after minimum distance that is very large, that used to be uh, the goal in the past because a lot of the action happens for signal-to-noise ratios where the average minimum distance is more important than the actual minimum distance. And this is just the point I made a bit earlier, that uh, you use uh, computer search to construct such LDPC codes, and they have more so the encoding was more complex than those that were already constructed in a systematic form. And they were introduced by Shulin and some collaborators. Then we begin cyclic codes. So when you talk about block codes, those cyclic codes are the most important as a subclass. When you talk about engineering applications, so you have cyclic codes in many, many practical applications. You have communication protocols, you have uh, CDs, DVDs, magnetic recording, and this is basically due to actually is the cyclic shift property and further mathematical properties that allow you to simplify the implementation of encoders and decoders. The formal treatment for cyclic codes is using polynomial rings and the polynomial coefficients belonging to a Galois field. You operate modulo x to the power n minus 1 and n, as usual, denoting the code block length. So the definition of a cyclic code is simply that as a code that is preserved by a cyclic shift. It means so you, if you shift your a given code word by a certain number of positions, say V, I, you will retain a code word in the same code. I avoided using a linear cyclic code because you have no linear cyclic codes as well that are also useful. It's not like when you say no linear code in general. 
you have applications where you map the code, let's say uh, the GFP, the P of prime number, you map the binary in a way that the binary code is non linear, but still useful for in, in some multi user uh, situations. So immediately you can use a representation of this vector by a polynomial, like V sub 0, V sub 1 times x, V sub 2 x squared, and so on, until V sub n minus 1 x to the power n minus 1. For the matrix representation, using properties of finite fields, any um, code word is a multiple of the polynomial which is unique is g of x has degree n minus k. And conversely, all polynomials of degree n most n minus 1, which are divisible by g of x, they are code words for this code. This is called the code generator polynomial, and this is a factor of x to the power n minus 1. Then it's just a repetition of what I mentioned earlier. Uh, so since each code word is the multiple of the generator polynomial. All those here are code words, and they happen to be linearly independent. So they suggest a way to implement the generator matrix or cyclic code using the, pol the generator polynomial and its uh, cyclic shifts, where in this matrix we assume that it's filled with, say, binary. Let's concentrate on binary zeros and ones, and the empty positions you fill in with zeros, so you have k rows and n columns. So you can anticipate that this cyclic shift property would allow you a sequential implementation of this matrix. Rather than have this form, you can uh, move on to have a sequential implementation. You can represent the information digits by a polynomial, since you have k positions, with the degree at most k minus 1. <coughs> and then, here we're going to show a trick where the resulting code word is already a systematic form, meaning the first k positions will be information digits and the remaining n minus k being parity checks. So what you do, you multiply this information polynomial y over x by x to the power n minus k. Notice that this is like if you have n positions, you are moving it forward. And then you have no zeros, you know, uh, no positions which are no zero having degree lower than n minus k. So next what you do, you divide this polynomial here by j of x. So you have a quotient and you have a remainder. You note that the remainder you have degree less than n minus k. So to get the cold word, you just move r of x to the other side with the minus, and you get the multiple of g of x. Therefore, what you get on the left will be a cold word. So you subtract, and then you obtain a cold word where this part here has no overlapping positions with r of x. So it is in systematic form. So how do you do that in a circuit? This is a simple circuit where here you have the coefficients of the generator polynomial. In binary, this is 1, the highest order 1, and the lowest order is also 1. And here can be zeros or 1s. When you have a 1, you close the switch. If it's a 0, leave the switch open. So what you do here, when you feed the message from this point, this has n minus k stages of shift resistance. So when you feed here, you're already pre-multiplying by x to the power n minus k. So after k shifts, you get inside here the parity checks, you open that switch here, and you move from 1 to 2 that, and you output, you empty that by sending the parity checks following 
the information agents that were here. You can also implement uh, an encoder using the parity polynomial h of x, but we're going to skip that. Here at least we find in the books. So humming codes have a cyclic representation as well. And uh, for the humming codes, the generator polynomial is a primitive polynomial. If you, if you have, uh, say, a primitive polynomial of degree n, it means it is, suppose you in binary, it's irreducible. In binary, you cannot write it as a product of polynomials of lower degree in binary. And also, uh, the binomial x to the power n minus 1, the lowest n for which uh, this, primitive, this polynomial can the factor is n equals to the, to the power n minus 1. This will be the lowest. So that would be the definition of a primitive polynomial. And this is exactly the parameters of the, the, the Hamilton code that we know. The determinate polynomial is primitive polynomials you can get from a table. The for degree uh, 2, 3, 4, and so on, people know by heart. But when you go to higher degrees if you go for a table to obtain it. You can decode them. We can see in a moment how a Megit decoder operates or a narrow trapping decoder. It, it's very straightforward because of the sequential implementation. And these codes, they also appear in the literature for other reasons. Uh, I mentioned one of them is protocol sequence for the collision channel without feedback. You can use the code words of Humming Week 3. You get properties also for people that work with designs. This is known for them. So the dual of the Humming codes are the maximum length sequence codes. When you have a shift register with linear feedback and stages, the longest uh, non-zero sequence that you can generate to have period q to the power n minus 1. So you have n stages. If you feed initial state to non-zero and you cycle it, the longest sequence you get is uh, q to the power n minus 1. Binary case q equals 2. They have these parameters here. These codes are really very important, for, although so simple for practical applications. You have them used in radar, or if you want say, to have a laser to measure uh, distance from the Earth to the moon and so on, you modulate a carrier using maximum length sequence code. The old telephone ECM systems use test sequence in sequence. But why is that? It's because they have very nice correlation properties. They are somehow uh, very close to what would be a digitized uh, white noise. Because when you compare the sequence with itself, you have maximum correlation. By shifting by one position compared with the original, you have already a very low value, which is constant for any other shift except the multiple of the length of the sequence, so you can detect the peak when that occurs. Actually, if you read the book from the 60s by Boulon, uh, is Digital Sequence with Space Applications, they talk in there how to measure distance. Have actually, have projects for, for, for the NASA you know, space research. and. You can, depending on the, the distance you want to measure, you can adjust the length of your sequence to avoid ambiguity and so on. But then if the sequence is very, very long, it can take a long time to find a peak. And so long at the time suggested an alternative, which was to achieve the same length by combining two, three or more sequences that had prime periods. 
So you could detect smaller peaks. The moment you detect one smaller peak, you found the phase of one of the component cities. And you go for the next one. So in that way, uh, instead of having the full length, as the worst case of trials to find the peak, you have the sum of those. And then that is taken to a problem in information theory, which you call the 20 question problem. That you can have 2 to the power 20 possibilities. But then if you ask 20 clever questions, you find that's the, the minimum number of questions you need to ask. <coughs> so the generator polynomial for this M sequence code you obtain by dividing x to the power n minus 1 by a primitive polynomial p of x of degree n. So you have the all-zero code word, and the remaining all-zero code words result just from cyclic shifts of the non-zero, and they have all the, the same Hamming weight. They are called like distant codes or simplex codes. This is again referring to way of decoding. That is a technique called the uh, orthogonalization that helps you use a majority vote to decode your code, and they are easily decoded, uh, orthogonalizable in one step. We mentioned already uh, spread, spread spectrum is also another application, radar location techniques. Then we go for the next, which is a it's more sophisticated in terms of mathematical structure, the BCH codes. Since at that time there was no internet, it's considered invaded simultaneously by Bose, Schalthuri in America, and Hockingham in France. Hockingham published in 1959, Bose Schalthuri published in 1960, but there was no internet, so it considered to be simultaneous. And the curiosity about this is that uh, the famous author of a book on error correcting codes called Peterson, Wesley Peterson, uh, probably he was a, a reviewer for the original paper of Bose and Shadwell because he devised a decoder, which probably he presented at a conference before the paper with the creation of the codes was published because it has a delay, you, you have something written, you won't experience that, and it can take a long time. Uh, what about time? It's about time. Okay, I, I thought it was a clock, meaning it was half past. So it's approaching 12 here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so just make a brief introduction, and I won't carry on, leave it for, for tomorrow. These codes are cyclic, and they are definitely one of the more important class of block codes because they have algebraic decoding algorithms that are very practical. I thank you for now and if you have any questions please uh, raise your hand. People questions don't be shy. If you are shy you can also ask you later. The tough ones for tomorrow. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so now we, we start the, 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 the posters uh, advertising. So all people that will present the poster, come here quickly. Okay, people that will present the poster now. Amiya, uh, Dimas, Mohamed, Setagat, and Morteza. And uh, yeah, you are here, right? Okay, uh, some announcements. Okay, some announcements. Ah, first of all, that's it.